Hi, everybody. I'm Jen Johnson, and this is Thought by Thought Healing, where I talk about everything related to chronic pain and chronic symptoms. I am a chronic pain coach and work through the mind-body connection and TMS uh, to reverse symptoms. I come at this from a Christian perspective, and so if that's important to you, then you're definitely in the right place and you should subscribe. But today, I had the honor of interviewing Dan Buglio from Pain Free You, who is also a pain coach. And he's just amazing. And I really enjoyed this conversation for two reasons. One is that every mind body coach, doctor, practitioner has their way of approaching this and the healing process. And Dan and I talk about our differences and our similarities in that. And it It's really enjoyable. So I hope that it's inspiring for you. And also, Dan just has this way of simplifying things, probably from the thousands of videos that he has done. He's able to just really um, break it down for us in a way that's palatable and easy to understand. So if you haven't checked out his videos before this, you should check them out, Pain For You, on YouTube. And there's also his website and group coaching, which I will put links for in the show notes. So Um, Without any further ado, I give you Dan, and I will talk to you guys later. Bye. Hi, everybody. Thanks for being here. I am super excited. Today, I have with me Dan Buglio. So, Dan, thanks so much for being here. Thank you. Appreciate the invitation. Yeah. And I know you also have a, uh, are you calling it a cold something? So, double thanks. Um, yeah, I've been feeling a little under the weather this week, um, trying to catch up on some sleep and, yeah. but I'm doing better. Thank you. Yeah. Good, good, good. So if the voice is a little scratchy or I look a little, uh, slow, that's why. <laughs> if you look a little slow, great. We will show you some grace then. Wonderful. Yeah. It's okay. funny. Uh, two nights ago, I did a recording, one of my daily videos and halfway through the video I just kind of spaced and I paused and I was like "Mm, that's like a 15 second pause I gotta stop so I hit stop and I you know took a break and came back and re-recorded but that almost never happens to me I'm usually like one take go anyway sorry about that that's um there's a lot to talk about there that's impressive to just post your first shot (laughs) Uh, I'm always one take. I don't have enough time to do multiple takes. Well, okay, let's start there. So can you tell us just, I I know a lot of us have heard your story, but for the few that are watching that haven't, just tell us a little bit about your, your, your pain background to start there. Yeah, I was in my early 30s. And for context, I'm in my late 50s, now 57. Um, so early thirties, had a young kid, money problems, marriage was good, but not perfect. Um, you know, typical stress, long commute, stressful job, uh, renting, not owning. So it was kind of this whole, how did I get here type of a mentality? Like, Mm. you know, when I was younger, when I was, you know, around 20, I was like, Oh, I want to be a successful businessman and lots of money and all this. And, you know here I am in my early thirties going, this isn't what I signed up for. Yeah. And disappointment. Well, yeah. Just like, how did I get here type of stuff? And so one day getting dressed, bending over to put on my underwear, I felt that typical back spasm, you know, when people say my back went out. No, it didn't. My back didn't go anywhere. I just had a, an acute onset of what we now know as TMS. Yeah. Um, and that started 13 long years worth of ups, downs, sideways, everything. Uh, for the first year, I knew nothing about who Dr. John Sarno was. I knew nothing about the mind-body concept. But then I found out about it, read his work, got better pretty quickly, right? As most, many people do, not most, but many people do. Mm-hmm. Um, but then a few months later, it came back and had another acute onset, another spasm, and up and down for the next 12 years. And it got to the point where it was very persistent because at least in the early days, it would like be there. I'd do the work and I'd get over it and I'd be fine. Then it would come back and after a while, it just stuck around. Mm -hmm. Uh, Varying levels of intensity, but it stuck around. 
and there was always that that fear of another acute attack and we know it's not really an attack it's just the way it feels right yeah. um so yeah it took me 12 years after finding out about sarno before i was able to i think accidentally stumble on some of the concepts that i teach now and even when i became pain free if you were to ask me well what did you do i don't know you know i couldn't explain it and it took me a long time to figure it out and um yeah so go ahead that's that's interesting because i was going to ask you um in those did you say it was 12 years or 13 13 total 12 yeah. after i found you know sarno healing back pain and mind body prescription okay so in those i was going to ask you in those 13 years um can you name things that you did wrong which is the opposite of the the question oh. you just answered but do you have an answer for that one what did you do wrong um pretty much everything i recommend we not do i was quite focused on the symptoms i was always aware of it monitoring measuring uh avoidance was a big thing for me where you avoid doing things that could hurt you and all that does is confirm the brain's perception that yeah that thing that you're avoiding it must be dangerous because you're not doing it um so i had the fear i had the attention given to it um i talked about my pain all the time which as we know is not a good thing because it keeps it present yeah. keeps it um wired if you will right mm -hmm. you know i don't get deep into neuroplasticity but you know, once pain becomes chronic, it's become learned. And there are some wirings there. I don't, I just don't think we need to unwire things. The brain knows what to do if we give it the right message. But the point of the matter is the more we talk about it, the more the brain's going to keep those connections going. Yeah. So I, I did everything wrong. When people go, oh no, it took Dan 12 years after he learned about Sarno to get rid of it. What hope do I have? And I'm like, time out. I was also going through this before Facebook, YouTube, podcasts, the internet was just barely getting started. And so that doesn't mean it's going to take anybody, you know, 12 years from the time they hear about Sarno to get better. Because yeah. not just me, but people like yourself and, you know, dozens and dozens or hundreds of other people sharing their knowledge of mind, body, pain or symptoms and the path they took. So there's, there's an infinite number of resources now compared to when I went through it. And so, um, yeah, I made every mistake in the book. Whatever one you can think of, I probably made that mistake. Yeah. I'm curious, you mentioned the avoidance. Um, were, there, um, were there also emotionally charged areas of life that you were avoiding? Does that question make sense? Um, it does during this journey this 13 years um i did have some marital problems mm -hmm. and i don't know if the marital problems were as a result partially to me being a chronic pain guy i was a guy with the back pain you know everybody in the neighborhood how's the back how's the back and i would talk about it um i don't know if I guess, yeah, there are certain things that we all avoid emotionally. Um, my belief about certain emotions was that if I was angry, I was just like my father and I never wanted to be like him. Mm. What did I do? Anger goes. Um, my mom's family had a bunch of, you know, her two brothers and her mother with depression. What did I do with sadness? I don't want to be mentally ill with depression like them. And so that kind of set the stage early in life that I don't want to be like that or like him. And so repression was absolutely going on. So when I was in my early thirties, you know, here I am a nice guy, you know, but I had some frustrations in life and what did I do? I swallowed them. Yeah. Eventually that, I guess, unresolved emotional world 
uh, came out in some TMS pain. Yeah. Um, but it is interesting though, because I did all the emotional work. I did the journaling. I did all the introspection about everything that happened in my life. And at the end of the day, that wasn't the answer for me. Yeah. You know, I know there's differing opinions. And if you watch many of my videos, you'll see I'm, I'm not really a big guy about journaling and digging up our skeletons from the past and really rehashing old traumas. And I, I don't know where you stand on that, but um, I know there are some people who vehemently disagree with my approach, which is leave the past in the past. Safety now is what matters. And um, so I don't know, I kind of wandered a little bit from your original question, but I love um, it. I think, and I've, and I've heard you talk about this. And so it's made me think about it a lot because in my healing journey, I, I used every tool. So it's, it's very fascinating because every time people ask me like, what are your, you know, your top three favorite tools? Well, I'm not really sure to be honest, mm -hmm. which ones were the most effective. Um, mm -hmm. cause I did all the journaling. And I was just thinking about this a lot yesterday in what did I really get out of my journaling? And what I got out of it was what personality traits did I develop from those times? So people pleasing came from X. Um, the pressure came from here. Perfectionism came from there. Um, and with those personality traits comes a whole list of I am statements or identity that are that are fear mongering um, mm -hmm. that were just a huge part of my life. So I think the journaling was not about going back and experiencing the emotions of that time. Sure, I did. Um, but it was more about freedom to let go of these developed personality traits that I was carrying with me that with them came TMS. Um, sure. So, so I think, so I think that's my big takeaway is more, what's my identity now? I don't, I'm, I, my identity isn't in people liking me. It's not in me being perfect. And, and I'm a Christian, which we talked about before this, and it's not about me being perfect for God every day. And, keeping in good graces with everybody. So letting go of some of those things um, was the was the emotional work that I did. Does that align with what you think or are we are we in different pages here? I, I think we're all on the same page. You know, um, I did a lot of the journaling and what I found was it just journaled myself into depression because I was focusing on everything that was wrong with my life. Yeah. Past, present, worries about the future, what was lacking. Yeah. And I always say, you know, whatever we focus on tends to grow and magnify. Yep. So if all we're doing is writing every day, twice a day about everything that's wrong with my life, my job, my marriage, my financial position, my everything else, after six months of doing that, boy, it's like, life is really awful when yeah. you look at it yep. that often. And I had to put the journal down and say, this is not benefiting me. And oh, by the way, I still have the pain. So, and I, I was able to decide for myself, I am not going to journal anymore. If there was benefit to it, I've already achieved it but it wasn't clearly not in my opinion, the answer. Yeah. Right. Because Sarno will have people believing it's all about repressed emotions, primarily anger and rage. And that has created decades worth of therapists, coaches, TMS experts that say, you got to go find those repressed emotions. Right. Well, if they're the subconscious, are they even accessible anyway? Maybe with some work and digging, you can like pull up those past experiences, but to what end? Yeah. You know, and I, I kind of view Sarno's right. The brain perceived emotions as dangerous and therefore it created in his words, a distraction to distract us from the emotional world. I like the word protect. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So he's right. The brain perceived emotions as dangerous because we were taught that emotions are bad, you know? Yeah. 
Don't be a big baby. Don't cry. Don't ever let them see you cry. Toughen up. Stiff upper lip. Um, don't get angry. God doesn't like anger, right? And all those kind of things. And if God doesn't like anger, then certainly parents and religious leaders don't like it either. So we can't do that because otherwise we're a bad person. And so there's so many different ways that we have learned that emotions are bad. In my case, it was the example that my father said that anger was not attractive. I didn't want to be like him. So I shoved it away. Um, yeah. I don't think we need to go digging up the past to feel safe in our emotions today. Yeah. I think it's exposure therapy to emotions. Give yourself permission to feel your right now stuff. We don't have past emotions, by the way. I don't know if you agree with that. We don't I, have past emotions. Yeah. We don't. No. We, they're we current. They're have emotions about a memory from the past, but you're still experiencing that emotion now. Yeah. You don't have future emotions either. You might have worries about the future, those thoughts. But the emotions are always right now. Any emotion you ever feel is right now. So my approach is very simple. Assuming the brain perceiving emotions as dangerous is the cause of the symptoms and pain, which is one of the perceived dangers that the brain can use to turn on the symptoms. Then the straightest way out is to teach the brain that emotions are safe. How do you do it? By feeling the emotions without judgment and without the story. Because the story is just rumination. And I don't know about you, but I, I remember times in my past where I could be having a conversation in my head about something that happened weeks ago. And I'm replaying it as if it's still going on. And I'm getting the emotional energy in charge as if it is still going on. Yes. And that other person doesn't even know I'm upset with them. Yeah. Right. So rumination is a big deal. So that's why I say feel the emotions. Without judgment, meaning I'm an awful person for feeling this way. Drop that. You're not. You're a human being. Yeah. And without the story, because the story will keep you in the emotion over and over and over again. And I have people always asking me, Dan, like, I don't get it. I'm, I'm feeling these emotions, but they're not releasing. I'm staying angry for seemingly weeks. Yeah. You're in story mode. Yeah. You're replaying the story over and over. So it's exposure therapy to emotions. If you can feel your right now emotions, whatever they are, without judgment, without the story, they will release. And over time, your brain's going to go, now oh, look, she's doing, uh, she's doing okay. Nothing bad happened. She, but she's been feeling all this intense emotions, but she's still okay. And the brain will eventually learn that it doesn't have to protect us from these emotions because you're okay and you've been feeling them right so i think that's the shortest way to get to the end of the road emotionally emotionally yeah and i think um just to your point and mm -hmm. i and i think what i am actually saying supports your point for me and and i do think i was different than other people with the writing my writing always ended with um empowerment of of uh uh of a fearless stance in some way in my, because those emotions that were from my past were present in my, in my, my memory and my subconscious, um, correcting the narrative, correcting the story I was telling um, in a way that allowed me to feel the thing and then let it go and move on. Um, and then no longer was my past dangerous. But yeah, if we're just writing and ruminating and it just, it leaves us just depressed and anxious and, and all those things. Um, and, and possibly re-traumatized. Yes, absolutely. Totally agree. So, okay. So that's emotionally. Um, yeah, yeah. um first, first of all, a, a couple, maybe like four podcasts ago, I actually accidentally referred to you as Dan Sarno. <laughs> Which I admit, yes, which I, I immediately slip any day. Yeah, yes. Which is funny that it was a Freudian slip and Sano and just so many jokes to be had in there. Um, but um, that that just brings up this point that I know you 
differentiate yourself from Sarno a little bit. Um, can you talk about that, or do you feel like you already talked about with the uh, that with the um, emotional repression piece? Um, I think Sarno was brilliant. He's correct in his assessment that the brain perceived emotions as dangerous. Now, that's not the only reason we can have symptoms show up as a result of the brain creating them, right? Yeah. I mean, I talked to people who, you know, had knee surgery and they developed TMS because they were terrified of the pain from the surgery and they were worried it wouldn't heal. And they convinced themselves that the surgery was messed up, it was botched, and therefore they ended up with chronic pain. Did that have much to do with repression and other emotions? No, it was purely a physical fear of not healing. Yeah. Um, so not everybody develops this mind, body pain or other symptoms because of emotional danger, if you will. Yeah. So I think there's an infinite number of perceived dangers that the brain can turn on symptoms from. Uh, yes, life stress, family stress, financial stress, relationship stress, all those types of things. And yes, you can lump them in with the emotional categories, but um, physical. See, I always say that once we develop the symptoms and they become persistent, the original cause almost doesn't matter because now we become afraid of our bodies and movement and body positions and activities and leaving the house and getting out of bed and everything else. And all of a sudden, the original cause may have already resolved itself. Whatever was going on at the time that caused it to start may be already resolved and now we're all of a sudden stuck with this medicalization which is getting traumatized by a medical system that hasn't been able to figure out how to help us yet because yeah. they don't understand it's coming from here and not here and yes. so doctor's visits all of the negative things that doctors say to us all oh, get used to it you'll probably be in pain the rest of your life type of stuff which is horrific these folks are supposed to do no harm and even just their words, like, it would be much better if a doctor could say, you know, you're checking out fine physically, so I'm not really sure what's going on, but I'm sure there's an answer out there. Hang in there. I don't have the answer within the scope of my medical world, but there's got to be a solution for you. Mm -hmm. That would be much better than I don't have the answer because I don't have the answer. You're in trouble for the rest of your life. Yeah. Those... You know, they're those words just they they play out forever in our brain and that ex, that expectation that predictive coding just takes over and yeah. well now you are in pain for forever until you interrupt that belief yeah what's your yeah, it's a big deal sorry go ahead sorry we keep interrupting each other um just briefly talk about mris and fmris and and your um I just like for this to come up. So you get an MRI and it shows up with um, a slip disc, et cetera. What's your take on it as a TMS coach? What do you say to people? What's showing up on the MRI may have absolutely nothing to do with your symptoms. Hey, look, Sarno originally wrote about it. These are normal abnormalities. Yeah. He called it the gray hair of the spine, right? Yeah. And, um, you know, MRIs are smart to get. If you want to eliminate life-threatening stuff, and I'm on board with Dr. Schubner in that regard, the way forward is to go, okay, what am I experiencing? Let me eliminate or rule out life-threatening things. Heart, lungs, yeah. infectious disease, cancers, anything significant that absolutely requires medical intervention. Let me rule that stuff out. So an MRI might not be a bad idea to get just to rule out cancers, tumors, maybe even fractures that you don't know about. Um, but once you've done that, all of the other opinions that the doctors share, well, I think it's this bulging disc and okay, doc, what's the proof that that's the cause of the pain? And they'll be like, well, if that's where you're hurting. So along the lines of the nervous system and it makes sense that that's what hurts because like okay but do people have the same structure and no pain 
Well, absolutely. You know, I mean, there's absolutely no correlation between it. Uh, there was a whole series of x-rays done where 200 and some odd x-rays and they mapped them out and put them in two piles. One people with pain, one people with no pain. Then they gave them to a bunch of radiologists and said, which pile is which? They couldn't tell the difference. Yeah. They couldn't tell the difference. And these are radiologists studied in, you know, reviewing these x-rays. Yep. So they're all similar. All MRIs are normal. Even the ones that show abnormalities, they're normal because most people have some to a degree or another. And so I did a video I don't know, a month, month and a half ago, I don't remember, called Normal Abnormalities, where I talk about this at length. And it's just like, if you're going to hang your hat on that diagnosis, you're going to be in pain for a long time. Because there's no evidence that that is the cause of the pain. So I just don't like, I also believe that the body has an innate wisdom for healing and wellness. Yeah. Right. I believe, yeah, I whether, totally believe, whether believe that. that comes from the body and the innate wisdom of the body or whether that comes from the brilliance from above in, in how we were designed and created, whatever your beliefs are, the body's natural state is health. Yeah. And it's only through, you know, um, toxic thinking, emotions, uh, toxic life, world, food, environment, everything else that things get in the way of our natural well-being. Yeah. So I, I think it's just a matter of trust the body. It knows what to do. If there's a true injury, don't sweat it. The body knows what to do. Yeah. You know? um, and if you've got something showing on your MRI that looks a little scary, so what? There's tons of people that have the same exact imaging result and no pain. Yep. I agree. So rule out the important life-threatening stuff. And then you rule in the mind-body. The mind body stuff so i was at the dentist probably like i don't know four months ago and uh towards the end of of my appointment she said it looks like you have this this and the other and um that that could lead to pain so we might want to do this preemptive thing and i stopped and i thought something's wrong here so i just asked her i said do some people who have what i'm heading towards not have any pain and she was like yeah actually a lot of people um have that and there's no pain i was like great i'm good no need for the operation <laughs> you know we don't need to let that fear um cause us to take these medical steps that are just going to reinforce pain in the future you know well reinforce the feeling that i'm broken in some way yeah absolutely the doctors don't really do anything to dissuade that belief because all doctors are designed to do is to diagnose problems. You have this, this, and that problem, and therefore you can expect X, Y, and Z. And that's what they do. And if you go, yeah, but do other people have the similar structure? Yeah, well, but in your case, no, then where's your proof, doctor? Proof, like hard proof. Yeah. And so, yeah, rule out the life-threatening, rule in TMS. Uh, Dr. Schubner put together a wonderful FIT assessment. Yep. Um, I've got that on my site. There's also a pain test that's been put together with 10 questions. And it just says, how's this, how are the symptoms behaving? Yeah. You know, and just, you don't need all of them, but you just need one thing as evidence, which is, you know, I went out with a couple of friends and I got involved in the conversations and my pain was so much better. Mm. Well, if it was structural, that can't happen. Right. Right. Or people who say, I feel great when I'm exercising, but when I come home and I sit on the couch, I hurt. Well, that can't happen if it's structural. It just doesn't make sense. So does the way your pain behaves make sense? If not, it's probably coming from the brain based on the brain perceiving danger. Yeah. So one of the differences between Dr. Sarno and I is that he was like, it's all about emotions. 
and I'm like, all right, let's let's emotions were perceived as dangerous. So let's take it up a step or two. I'm not saying Sarno is wrong. And I'm not saying I'm above him. I'm just saying there's more perceived dangers than just emotions. Mm -hmm. Like so, what? Like what? Mm -hmm. Body movement, yeah. body positions, a mattress that's too hard or too soft, mm -hmm. uh, walking, bike riding, sitting in a hard chair at a restaurant. Those are all perceived dangers. Yeah. Getting in a fight with your sister-in-law. You know, having your mother be a little bit judgmental. Any of those things that causes an increase in symptoms, that's because your brain is perceiving that thing, that event, that situation as dangerous. Yeah. You know, some people might be, they may have experienced abandonment as a child. You know, parents weren't there for them, weren't supporting of them. And all of a sudden a relationship breakup may trigger that whole abandonment history and before you know it symptoms are through the roof um other people may have had a very traumatic childhood with some abuse and so anything in their adult life that feels like an attack even if it's just a verbal attack can absolutely trigger the whole childhood trauma and what does the brain do danger 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 yeah, yeah. Here's some symptoms and they can spike up it all, in my opinion, the whole thing can be summed up by when the brain's perceiving danger, symptoms are the result. Virtually every symptom is the result of the brain perceiving danger, even legitimate ones. Right. You cut your hand in the kitchen, it hurts. But one of the examples I gave in a video not too long ago was uh, there are stories of, you know, chefs or people working in the kitchen and they slice their hand. And because the knife is so sharp, they don't even feel it. They don't even realize it until they see the blood. That's when the pain comes because now it's like, uh oh, I got a problem. Right? Yeah. And so, why didn't it hurt initially? Because the brain wasn't aware of it. The brain didn't perceive danger until it realized you just cut yourself. Right. Pain is not a reliable indicator of the condition of the body. Yeah just not it is a very reliable indicator of the brain's perception of danger so the brain has detected perceived danger so now you're talking to a client they know it's perceived danger um somebody's disagreed with them uh danger mm -hmm. pain how do we sh how, do, how do you tell people then to shift from that um from that response into safety how what does that mindset shift look like because sometimes we can name it we know it but how do we how do we change that mindset so i think this is a top-down approach mm -hmm. meaning subconscious is completely in control as to whether or not that switch called pain or other symptoms mm -hmm. and i want to emphasize that other symptoms because there's tons of symptoms yep dizziness, vertigo, reflux, you name it. Not everything is pain, but there's a bunch of symptoms. Uh, but the subconscious brain is in control of that. We cannot consciously control pain. I can't say hand hurt. Come on, hurt, make it hurt. You can't turn it on, just like you can't turn it off, no matter how much we try, right? So the subconscious is in control. How do we get to the subconscious? The only way we can affect or influence the subconscious is with the conscious brain. Yeah. So it all starts on a foundation of accurate information. What the heck is going on? How does this stuff work? How does the human body work? You know, because if you don't understand it, you're going to be terrified of the symptoms. Yep. Because, you know, pain means something's wrong. And so if you truly understand that it's not reflection of the body, it's a reflection of the brain perceiving danger. Well, now we can teach safety. And I know that's your question. So how do we actually do it? Well, I think the best way to dial down fear is to really know what's causing the symptoms in the first place. Because it's hard to turn down the fear if you have no idea what's happening. Yeah. 
-hmm. So you got to know the accurate information. And then the next step is assessing whether or not that applies to you, which was what we were talking about before. Rule out the life-threatening crap. Right. Rule in TMS. Yep. How are your symptoms behaving? Are there any uh, oddities about how it behaves and when you have it and when you don't? Like, okay, my pain comes around in the afternoon, but in the morning I feel fine. Okay. Well, if it was truly your spine, then that wouldn't happen. Right. Yeah. It's just some of those things just don't make sense. Um, so accurate knowledge, acceptance that this is what's going on with me. The only thing that's going on is my brain is perceiving danger, turning on the symptoms. And so the goal is how do I teach the brain that we're actually okay? Accurate knowledge, acceptance that that's what's going on. And from there, I like to explain that uh, we experience the world in three main ways, emotionally, physically, mentally. Many of us also have a spiritual state. Now, I don't go into that in my teachings because everybody's spiritual state is different, but we can at least agree that every human being, whether you're a year old or 96 years old, has an emotional state, a physical state, and a mental state. So for me, it stands to reason that if we can show and teach the brain that we're safe emotionally, physically, and mentally, which are the three ways we experience life, the whole system is going to settle down. Yeah. So we talked about it earlier. How do we teach the brain that emotions are safe? Feeling them without judgment, without the story, so they can release. And the brain eventually, through exposure to these emotions, goes, wow, look at Jen. She's felt some intense stuff this week. She's Nothing bad happened. Emotions are safe. How do we do that physically? Right. And I don't mean... I'm sitting in a chair today. How do I convince myself that my back shouldn't hurt? That's not what I'm talking about. That's too focused on the symptoms. Mm -hmm. But in general, the subconscious brain is always monitoring what we're doing. And if, for me, I walked around for over a decade like a robot because I was so guarded and protected that I was like, oh, oh don't do anything fast. Don't move too quick. If you got to bend over, bend at the knees, not at the waist. And so, in order to teach the brain that we're safe physically, a tense tight body doesn't convey the message that just convinces the brain that there's a tiger in the room and where is it, right? Yeah. So what's your physical state? If you're tense tight, you're clenching the steering wheel, your jaw is clenched and you're just, your shoulders wanna hang out with your earlobes, uh -huh. the brain has no choice but to go, something dangerous has happened. What's going on? And the brain will stay highly vigilant as will the nervous system, right? So the best way to convey safety to the brain physically is relax the body. Yeah. Now that doesn't require, you know, 30 minutes of meditation and breath work twice a day forever. Some people love that stuff. I tried some of that stuff and I never really got a benefit out of it. So what I coach today is notice your physical state. Oh, I'm like this. Let me relax my body so yes. that I can breathe. I'm not going to say do breath work because in many cases, breath work, meditation, other practices are viewed by the brain as there's something wrong. Look at all this weird stuff they're doing to fix themselves. There must be some problem. So you view breath work as more along the lines of massage and chiropractic work and it's some sort of manual therapy or um a, a, an I don't outside know that I, job what i don't i don't quite know if i put it in the same category as the physical charge to your insurance company type of treatments uh -huh. but i do believe that i'm trying to think about how the brain perceives these things i had a guy you know masculine guy played sports all his life but he was having a lot of pain he's like dan do i need to meditate like, well if you never had pain would you be meditating he says no heck no i was like then don't meditate now because if you feel like you have to meditate in order to get rid of your pain your brain's got no choice but to perceive that something's wrong that you're doing this weird thing called meditation and to anybody who likes meditation no offense my point is in that context the brain is perceiving that as a fixing activity. What are you fixing by doing breath work and counting in for five and exhaling for eight? And that's not how we normally breathe. 
You want to know how we normally breathe? Just watch somebody sleep. I know that sounds creepy, but <laughs> it is. <laughs> but like if you have a kid and they're like tired and they're falling asleep, you can hear the difference in their breathing once they yeah. drift off into sleep. Is that more relaxed, full? So I don't like formal breath work. It's wonderful if you like it. No, I'm not against it. I just think if we're trying to teach the brain that we're safe and we're using our body to do that, a relaxed body that's breathing comfortably on its own natural rhythm, natural pace, sends a message directly to the subconscious brain that we're safe, we're okay. Because if we weren't safe, we'd be more like this, breathing shallow, right? So I just try to condense it and make it as simple as possible. No deep emotional work. You don't need therapy for 10 years. You don't need, you know, all sorts of uh, trauma work, whatever it may be. Just feel your emotions without judgment. Try not to ruminate on the stories. Physically, just when you notice you're tense, allow your body to relax so you can breathe normally. It sends the message to the brain that says, I'm okay. Look, I'm relaxed. Yeah. Simple, simple, simple. The third way we teach ourselves that we're safe is thinking, right? Now, some of the thinking is accurate knowledge about what's going on in the first place. But as you know, you're a human being, our thinking can sometimes cause some trouble, right? A little bit. Absolutely. So, you know, I'm not going to tell you to stop thinking negatively. And there are programs out there that say no negative thinking at all, stay in a state of elation at all times, no negative thinking. And I think those type of programs are setting the bar so high that failure is inevitable. Yeah. Because if you were to say, you'll never get better unless you can stop all your negative thinking. Yeah. Why even start? That's impossible, right? So you don't have to stop your negative thinking. You don't have to fix your negative thinking. Right, we've got 60 to 70,000 thoughts a day. Is it possible that many of those thoughts are either untrue yeah. or not helpful? Absolutely. Probably if you're stuck in chronic pain, I would say the vast majority of those thoughts are untrue and not beneficial. Yeah. So I guess instead of trying to stop those thoughts or trying to fix them and make them positive and release them to the rainbows in the sky. Why not just not take the thoughts seriously? Yeah. By default, you have a negative thought and you say, I don't need to pay attention to that. The odds are in your favor that that's a good decision because so many of them are not true and not helping. Yeah. There's no downside to saying, oh, I don't have to buy into that. Yeah. I see there to be three ways of dealing with those negative thoughts and each of us are slightly different, but one is like confront it straight on with like the fighting it that we're talking about, not doing it in this moment, but you can address it that way and say, go away. I hate you. No, I mean, whatever. Um, the other is just to shut the door and not listen to it and move on. Um, let it be, let it be there, but don't buy into it. Um, mm -hmm. And the other is to gently speak truth to it. No, I'm strong and I'm okay. And I'm here in this present moment and going to keep going. Those are three different ways that you can play around with the fact that we do have so many negative thoughts every day. And they are most of the time not based in any validity or truth. Or so we're reality. arguing with the fool. Yeah, or reality. Yeah. Yeah, I like to say we've got an inner roommate. <laughs> inner roommate is chattering away at us. Right? All day, every day. That's great. And they don't even pay rent. And that seems a little confrontational, but truth of the matter is a brain that is perceiving danger and is scared, all the negative thoughts are is the brain's attempt to keep us safe. What if it's this? What if it's that? You better not do this. Oh my goodness. Don't go there. Don't do this. That it might be a problem. Mm -hmm. Where are all those negative thoughts coming from? Mm -hmm. 
brain that just says, you're not safe, stay home. Yeah. You're not safe. Don't do that. Don't do that. Don't you dare bend over to pick something up. Don't you remember you got a bad back? Right. Right. Don't you dare go see your mother-in-law. Last time you went there, you had a huge flare up in emotions and pain. Right? Yeah. All those negative thoughts are, if you look at it as your brain's attempt to keep you safe. Mm -hmm. So what, yeah. would wrong, what would be wrong with saying, hey, brain, shh. Yeah, my mother-in-law might not be so wonderful, but she's not dangerous. Right. And so two things. I'm not going to ruminate on it. I'm not going to take those thoughts so seriously. And certainly, Mr. or Mrs. Brain, you don't have to create symptoms as a result. Yeah. You know, one statement that came out of my group coaching, this, this lovely lady, Ingrid, um, she made a comment in the group. She was like, life can be very lifey, yeah. but you don't have to hurt. Yeah. You don't have to hurt. And it doesn't matter what you're going through. And even if you're going through something big and the symptoms jump, they don't have to jump. And the sooner you can remain calm and reassure yourself and kind of bring yourself off the ledge and not panic, the sooner that little spike in symptoms can settle back down. And I just did a video today on setbacks. It's mm -hmm. all about two words. Don't panic. Yeah. So we kind of talked about the fear of a diagnosis or an MRI or structural, something being wrong with you. There's another category that a lot of fear um, erupts from, and that's the people who believe it's TMS but they're straight up just afraid of the pain mm -hmm. um which is just slightly different um can you talk about that I, I i love to hear you go on your monologues of i don't care how you know like i'm moving on you can be here can you can you do that for us how do you treat how do you treat a symptom that um you don't want to be afraid of but it's there it all, in my opinion, it all comes back to accurate knowledge. Meaning, if you truly understand what causes pain, if you can remain rational, which is tough to do, by the way, um, I guess the question is, are you afraid of something that your brain's creating in an effort to protect you? It's weird though. I thought where you were going with this question is um, once you get outside of the diagnosis, people are just afraid of the pain, right? Some people become afraid of, oh no, I wish it was physical. Now it's TMS. Yeah. That means I have a mental problem, an emotional problem, and I've got to figure this out. And I'm too anxious. I'm too nervous. I'm too health anxious. I've been freaked out about my health my whole life. I don't have what it takes to overcome this because holy crap. And a lot of people will judge. I'm doing this to myself. Yeah. It's not true. First thing I'll tell everybody is it's not your fault. It's not, it's where you ended up through no fault of your own. Mm -hmm. But, um, I don't know. We don't have to be afraid of the pain because Dr. Sarno even said it's benign. There's no, it doesn't leave a mark on the body. You know, and I've met some people with some pretty wild symptoms who are better now. And the body's the same as it ever was. Yeah. That's why it's called the invisible disease. Right? Yeah. Because to everybody else, you look normal. But we don't feel normal. No, not everybody. Some people look um, like they're suffering because of body contortions and, you know, mobility issues and all that stuff. Right. Right. Um, but how do you not be afraid of the pain by knowing that there's nothing horrible going on in your body? That's a starting point. Then afterwards, it's a matter of just recognizing, you know, you've got a hundred percent track record of making it through every bad day you've ever had hundred percent track record. So if you're having a bad day today, you're pretty tough. Look what you went through already and you're still here. Yeah. Why be afraid of it? And then, you know, if you do decide that panicking and freaking out is your best option, 
just know that you're delaying recovery because you're fueling it with the fear and the attention. And if it's all based on perceived danger, do you want to tell the brain, yes, we're in danger, I'm freaking out? Or do you want to say, hey, come on, we know what's going on. We understand how this system called the human body works. And I know you're trying to protect me, but there's really nothing bad going on. Yeah. That's tough to do when you're in a 10 out of 10 pain. I get it. And people who focus solely on the pain have a tough time convincing themselves that they're okay which is why so much of what I do in these daily videos is about how this system works, that there's really nothing bad going on and that calm is the way forward. Um, and I get a lot of people from around the world saying they're so much better as a result of just implementing these simple concepts. It's not, it's not that crazy complex. Yeah. Pretty simple. Yeah. It's, I mean, if I could summarize everything we've just talked about in the last maybe 15 minutes is a mindset shift. Just it's all mindset. Yeah. And and um you know in those categories that we just mentioned. So fear of fear of structurally a diagnosis, um, fear of the journey out of healing. Can I do it? Is there something wrong with my brain? I can't mm -hmm. handle it's one of the hugest issues, truthfully. And by the way, you said is there something wrong with my brain? Nope, nope, and nope. Yeah. I say your brain and your nervous, and there's all these programs about nervous system regulation and retraining and amygdala retraining and neural rewiring programs and all this stuff. And I think they way overcomplicate the whole thing. Um, there's nothing wrong with your brain or nervous system. It's working perfectly, flawlessly, because you're not sick. It's working perfectly. It's just that your brain is operating on misinformation and fear. Yeah. And with misinformation, it's going to make a decision that goes, we're in trouble. I need to warn them somehow. And the subconscious brain uses symptoms to warn us, whether it be stomach distress or reflux or, you know, whatever's going on. Um, back pain, headaches, migraines, you name it. I think one of the things that I, for me and for, I've had a couple clients bring up brain fog and I had horrific brain fog when I was in chronic pain. I mean, people would finish my sentences for me. I couldn't come up with words like water bottle at times. Um, mm -hmm. And it made me feel like there was something wrong with my brain, right? I'm stupid, obviously. Things are going downhill with, I'm getting dementia, you know, like all these catastrophizing thoughts. Um, and once I started switching that language from catastrophizing and from fear, like just drenched mindset, my brain started operating exactly how it was, which it was, it was healthy. It was smart, um, totally capable of learning, mm -hmm. but because it was so drenched in fear, it felt like something's wrong with my brain. Absolutely. But there's not, there was nothing wrong with me and there's nothing wrong with you, whoever's listening to this. Yeah. Oh, your brain's working perfectly. It's just operating on bad data. And as a result, it's turning on symptoms or pains because it perceives something bad is going on and it's trying to warn you. Yeah. That's all that's going on. It's a false alarm. Yeah. Yeah. Um what 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 do you what do you have to say about personality traits and all and all this? Um I think um, you know, I'm not huge on going back and analyzing childhood, but most of the personality traits that we've developed, people pleasing, perfectionists, do-gooders, uh, all that kind of stuff, were our childhood survival mechanisms. Because if we grew up in a chaotic environment, what's the best way to keep out of chaos? Be really good, be really nice, please other people, be perfect, do well in school, right? All that, be a high achiever, right? I don't think we have to change anything about our personality. I don't. It's, it, it may be what led us here, but I don't know that we necessarily have to change who we are. 
because that would seem fairly overwhelming, right? You know, somebody who's always putting other people first. Look, sometimes there are benefits to uh, creating boundaries and uh, all that stuff, but we don't have to become a whole new person. We can still teach our brain that we're safe and there's no reason to hurt. And even if we are putting somebody else's needs before ours, and that could be infuriating to our inner self, you still don't need to hurt. And Interesting. I like to, right? Because it's like anything. You can have a crazy relationship, but you don't have to hurt physically. Right? You could have just gone through a big breakup or lost somebody who, who passed away. And I know in many cases, symptoms are the result because the brain just automatically goes into that protection mechanism. We can teach the brain that we don't have to hurt physically because, hey, the emotions are tough enough. Mm -hmm. Why do I need to hurt physically too? So I don't know. I, I don't have a belief that we have to change who we are. By teaching yourself that you're safe, mentally, physically, emotionally, choosing how we respond to the symptoms, focusing on life, we end up being a different person. We're less, we're less concerned with what other people think. And we do end up changing. But that's a net positive result down the line. Yeah. I would hate to tell people, yep, you're in pain because you're a perfectionist. So you got to stop that. Otherwise, you'll be in pain forever. That's a pretty big nocebo. And so I don't think we have to change who we are. I'm still the same person as I was in my 30s. That's so interesting. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to really think about that because I know for me, um, I a lot of my personality traits, um, I worked really hard on not being a people pleaser and a um, pressure and I don't know, uh, being perfect morally, uh, if you will, legalistic. Uh, and so I had to work a lot on turning those down um, as part of, as part of um, turning down the pain. So that's, that's food for thought. I'll have to, I'll have to think about that. Um, Cause I know there are a lot of things in my life that I taught myself it is perfectly safe for me to be in these environments without changing the environment, right? Mm -hmm. Like, cause it's just perceived. So I can, let's just use a simple example of social anxiety. I don't have to change a social situation in order to feel safe in it now. I show up and just know that I am safe. I didn't change anything. Um, so go ahead. I like to separate out what's it going to take to get rid of the pain or symptoms versus what seems to make sense for me. Mm -hmm. So people are like, uh, do I have to leave my spouse in order to get better? Mm. Like, heck no. Mm -mm. Nope. No. It's a separate discussion for you to have. If you never had any pain, would you stay with them or would you leave them? Separate it, because if you think you need to make a massive shift in your life, like I need to quit my job in order to get better from TMS, um, I don't know. I don't think you do. So how about this? Why don't you teach your brain that there's no reason for you to hurt, that you're safe mentally, physically, emotionally. You're not giving your symptoms much attention or concern at all. The brain eventually learns that, wow, we really don't need to hurt. On a completely separate note, do you like your job or do you want to switch it? Uh -huh. They don't have to intermingle. Yes, life is messy and there's a lot of blurred lines everywhere. But I still think that even in a very stressful environment, we can get better despite life being very lifey. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Interesting. My marriage, yeah, my marriage was falling apart for a period of about seven years. I got better in the middle of that chaos before yeah. she and I eventually decided to part ways. Yeah. So 
we can still have lots of intense stuff going on and still get better. Yeah. It's all about safety. Yeah. And, and I do, I, I absolutely do believe that. Um, yep. I think, I think I love the idea of letting perfectionism go and letting the people pleasing the legalism go. Um, so that was a big part of my journey is I, I wanted to shed those developed personality traits that really were not naturally me. It's not who I am. It's who I had, you know, become, um, yeah, but I can see how you would separate them out. Separate it and say, those things aren't what I want to be. But if you're trying to shed them in order to get your body to stop hurting. This is an interesting discussion. I love it. But, it, but it's interesting. Yeah, I mean, I don't think we need to change who we are. I like to joke that, you know, I'm a version 5.7 Dan. 57 years old, 5.7, whatever. Okay. Little play on numbers there, but we're always changing. We're always becoming a new person. But I don't like overcomplicating recovery from this chronic symptom, chronic pain by incorporating need a new spouse, need a new job, need a new personality, you need to stop doing this, this, and that. You need to rewire your brain. You need to stop all negative thinking. You need to stay in a state of elation all the time. Like, There's so much stuff out there. You know, There's some TMS coaches who are like, you got to become like Zen, like a Buddhist monk and just like so Zen and chill and let nothing... Bar- really? So we're, we can't be human and experience the ups and downs of being human. Right. Yes, we can. Yes, we can. Trust me. I'm very human. Um, Yeah. But I don't have anything chronic going on. Yeah. Okay. So two more to wrap up Two. I'm not in a rush. So okay. We'll, I want to respect your, your, no, 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 it's okay. My afternoon is free. So as long as we want to go. Okay. Um, okay. So the other, the other two things that I do want to discuss and take as much time as we want, but one is just this idea of just, let's just live now. I mean, part of, you might even argue that healing, which I know you don't love that word, but be careful what you say, because my <laughs> website is thought by thought healing. So, um, so I won't tell anybody. <laughs> great. <laughs> um, and and what we're what Dan and I are laughing about is you don't have to heal, right? Like th- there's nothing wrong in our bodies. So, um, getting out of chronic pain is not healing your body. Nonetheless, I'm I'm still thought by thought it's healing. A different perspective. I just really like the clarity of saying there's nothing to heal. You're not broken. Yeah. Uh, but yet virtually everybody else in the TMS world talks about this being a healing journey. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I just reframe it that we are teaching. We're teaching the brain what's actually going on. We're teaching the brain. We don't need to be afraid. Mm-hmm. When the brain gets that message, it can turn off the symptoms. But look, I won't judge you for using the word healing. Thanks. <laughs> Appreciate it. <laughs> well, what was your question? Where were um, you going with my- my statement, I think, was healing is really about living. It's about learning to live. Um, and you talk about this beautifully and uh, quite often. Um, so, yeah, what's your what's your take on that? If we're not healing from something, we're not fixing anything, what are we doing? As little as possible to get rid of the symptoms. Yeah. Right? I just did a video the other day. It was, I forget the title. It was... Uh, Is trying harder at recovery a good idea? Yeah. The answer is absolutely not. Because the harder you're trying, the more you're convincing the brain that there's a big problem I'm trying to fix. No, we're trying to convince the opposite, that there's really nothing to fix, that we're actually okay already. How much time would you spend, you know, rebuilding the engine in your car if it's brand new, it's got 10 miles on it, and it's in the garage and it works perfectly? I just go drive it. Zero, right. Um, so there's really not a lot to do. I just had somebody email me and say, Dan, what is your program involved? I know um, one of the groups, one of the popular uh, groups that also has an app, 
has like four hours a week of homework. Mm -hmm. What is your program involved? I'm like, I don't give homework. I don't. It's mindset. And I've been called the mindset man. You know, been talking about mindset, indifference. It's kind of like, uh, why do I have to spend much time on this? Indifference. But you can't just be walking around saying, I don't care. I don't care. I don't care. Yes, you do. That's not indifference. Indifference is literally where you don't care whether you hurt or not today. Authentically indifferent. But that's not the only choice. You know, there's freak out, which nobody ever got better by freaking out. Indifference is the opposite of that. But in the middle is your ability to calmly reassure yourself that, all right, come on, John, we've been down this path before. I know the symptoms are kicking right now, but I know I'm okay. Remaining calm is, is key. So as far as how do you, what do you do? How do you live your life? Engage. Engage in something other than trying to figure yourself and your problems out. Yeah. Right? Just engage. Do something that gets your mind occupied on something other than poor me and my problems and my symptoms and how do I fix it and what's wrong with me and why is my brain torturing me and 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 yeah. step out of that world and that's inevitably why some people can not everybody but some people can go on vacation and do well and they come back home and boom pain's back yeah. you know it's an association thing they come back and it's like oh I'm back in the place where I've hurt the most and the brain goes, oh, crap, we're in the danger zone. Here's the pain again. We're on vacation. No associations at all. You're thinking about the beautiful beach and the sky. And, you know, everything is wonderful. And you're not thinking about your symptoms as much. So what do we do? Remove all of that hyper-focus, hyper-vigilance, despair. Step out of the pity party and... Do something engaging. Even if you're stuck in bed because the symptoms are so high, call a friend and make a promise to yourself not to talk about your symptoms. If they ask you, say, yeah, I don't want to talk about that. How are you? What's going on? Tell me a funny story. What's new with your husband, your kids, your whatever? What's wrong with that? Step outside of your head. Even if it's just watching stupid cat videos on YouTube, do something that gets you out of your I got to fix myself mentality. Yeah. Live more, fix less. Yeah, it's interesting because those those negative thoughts, ants, whatever you want to call them, um, okay. the ruminations, um, that the essence of that voice tells us to to stay at home, figure it out, um, resolve the thing. Mm -hmm. um, it, it it doesn't. It doesn't work that way. And so I love that word engaging, go do something engaging, something that you can put your attention on because sitting there thinking about it is not gonna help anything. And it's the same with the symptoms. Again, that voice is telling us, don't use your body. <laughs> and we, we actually need to do the opposite of what that yeah. inner roommate that you call it um, is, is begging of us to do um, and I love this. I, I'm going to keep going with it. Just tell it, hey, look, you're not paying rent. I'm going out. I'm doing my thing. Because <laughs> uh, that, I know you don't like the wiring, but that's that's a way of letting go of this connection that we have with these symptoms. Yeah, the brain is going to wire what we think about and focus on most often. Yeah. So why would you possibly want to focus on the thing you want to get rid of? I had the story about the Spanish language. In high school, I had to take two years of Spanish. I wasn't good at it. It was required in order to graduate. And I knew if I didn't graduate, my dad was going to kick my butt. So I had to learn it. And I was able to pass, uh, not with a great grade, but I passed. And uh, there's wiring happening as you learn a language yeah. or learn a musical instrument or learn something else. Wiring happens. But I don't get into the whole wiring and rewiring thing because, frankly, in every other realm of human existence, how much time are you spending thinking about how your brain wires things? If you're going to learn the violin, are you saying, now I have to wire or rewire this portion of my brain 
No, you never do. You just focus on what you want and the brain figures all that stuff out. Mm -hmm. So with Spanish, when I got through high school, I did not have to rewire my brain to get rid of Spanish. Yeah. All I did was say, I no longer need to speak Spanish. And I focused on college and playing music and that kind of stuff. Yeah. My brain did, handled all the wiring itself. So yes, neuroplasticity exists. It's nice to understand it, but none of what I coach is around wiring. Right. I just say, don't talk about it. It's bad. It, it'll keep it persistent. Yes, neuroplasticity is why, but we don't have to do anything proactive. All these neural retraining programs and amygdala retraining and this and that, I think they're overcomplicating. Yeah. You know? I love the language um, analogy. I, I think it's so good. And, th and that's just what we're doing by getting out there and, and doing engaging things and, and things mm -hmm. that, that keep our attention um, is learning a new way, a new way of being um, that's mm -hmm. calm and peace and homeostasis and peace that passes understanding or whatever, whatever way you want to describe that, um, uh, the health, <laughs> if you will. Uh, so yeah, get out there. Can you, um, can you talk about your, your group sessions? And I'm really curious if, um, as you talk about, if you, do you have any, do you have any rules around the group coaching and, um, what should and shouldn't be talked about? Um, they're gentle rules. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But the first and foremost is try not to speak in a way that will trigger everybody else in the room. What does that mean to you? It well, means I... try not to use descriptive language that comes right out of a horror movie as you describe your symptoms. Yeah because some people are very practiced at describing in terms that come out of a Freddy Krueger movie um, about the level of symptoms and how intense, and I won't even use the terms, but I, I think you know, you've heard people describe symptoms in such a way that you go, oh, it just hurts me listening to it. Yeah. And you know, I got a group where there's a bunch of people in a Zoom meeting in varying stages of vulnerability. And some people are freaked out just showing up in the first place. Now, the last thing they wanna hear is watching somebody else cry as they describe how horrific their symptoms are. So I say, look, you, you wanna say colorful sensations, way better than you know excruciating pain or whatever. So just try to be sensitive to other people. We don't really talk about symptoms much. As a matter of fact, many of the people in the group, unless I've known them for a while, I don't even know what their symptoms are. Yeah. It really doesn't matter. It's not like I ask them to fill out a questionnaire and say, what symptoms? Let's work. All right. So today we're going to work on pelvic people. No, it has no bearing on the coaching. The solution is the same, whether you got pelvic pain, migraines, headaches, shoulder pain, knee pain, whatever. It doesn't matter how you got there. The solution's all the same. So the group is really geared towards implementation, not symptom discussion. And I know some people want to like tell their story. You know, we try to like limit that. Not because we don't want to hear it, but because it's not beneficial to the rest of the group. And it's almost not beneficial to the person who wants to tell their story. You've told your story enough. And if you want a group of understanding people, we're it because we get it. We understand it. But I like to keep things focused on solution, which is how can we teach ourselves that we're safe? What behaviors, thoughts, actions, activities can we do to make sure we feel safer, not more in danger? Yeah. Yeah. And that talking about, about the symptoms definitely moves us back into danger mode. Mm-hmm. I just wanted to touch on this concept. Um, you ever have a coaching client say, Jen, I don't know what it is, but I have no joy. I can't find any happiness. Yeah. My take on that whole thing is 
our brain's job from the moment we were conceived until the moment we eventually die is to keep us safe and alive. And for people who say, I have no joy, I can't even smile playing with my kids, I'm no joy. My answer is your brain's trying to keep you safe and there's a priority list in the brain. If the brain thinks, I gotta keep you alive, we're in trouble, where does happiness fall on that list? Mm. The bottom. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I mean, the brain is literally going, we're in trouble. And you want to be happy? No. It's not, it's not important. So for anybody who's listening, who is having a tough time finding some joy or putting a, an authentic smile on your face, that will come. I promise you that will come. You know, one of my group coaching members uh, said her husband was thrilled. And he says, I got my wife back. She's smiling. She's laughing. And this is a person who was bedridden for, for years. Yeah. Four months ago, she drove her car for the first time in seven years. That's like amazing. there's powerful stuff. Yeah. People that didn't want to be on the planet last August are like now gallivanting Europe because they're from Scotland. You know, wild stories, people getting better and joy comes back. Not when you force it not when you demand it, but when the brain starts to feel safe, mm -hmm. it will open your heart up to joy. Yeah. So I wanted to bring that up because it's so important because so many people are just so full of despair yeah. and hopelessness. Yeah. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. I, I told a lot of people with depression. Uh, I mean, I feel like anxiety and depression just come with come with the pain one or the other or both yeah yeah my take on the whole depression and even the anxiety they're not separate problems to fix mm -mm. right another symptom right i believe yeah it's a symptom of a brain that's perceiving danger yeah it all comes down to perceived danger i swear everything mental health physical health you name it um to me depression is Deep sadness plus no hope. Yeah. How do you fix depression? Find some hope. Right. Because when you find some hope, you're no longer depressed. You may still be sad, but we can deal with sadness. If we're sad because we think our life sucks and there's no hope that I'm ever getting out of it, that's what depression looks like. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and, and you know it's it's interesting because some people find out about TMS or realize what it is, and for them that um, feels disheartening and hopeless. Um, and I just want to pitch the opposite because to me, it's just straight up hope. Um, it's best news ever. The best thing you could ever hear. Yes. <laughs> yeah. 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 But it is weird though. There's there's a cycle of highs and then uh oh, it's like oh good. I'm not really broken. Yay. This is great. Yeah. Oh, crap. You mean I have to do this? Yeah. This I, I got to fix this. I've been too anxious. I've been this and that. And I don't know if I have what it takes. And now some people said to me, I wish it was physical. I'm like, no, you don't. Because yeah. the doctors don't have the answer. You've tried that already. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. I was going to say something there. And then it <laughs> went away. <laughs> Brain fog. Yeah. Water bottle. Water bottle. <laughs> yeah. How about how about coffee? Actually, can I just say that I'm out of regular coffee, so today I am drinking decaf coffee, and and I'm still here in an interview, so that's good. <laughs> yeah. Um. Okay. Just before we end, tell us just a little bit more about your group, um, where people can find you, your group um, coaching, um, even sh if you're okay with sharing costs. I think I've heard you say that publicly. So just tell us yeah. a little bit about that. Yeah. So before I ever started the group, I was doing one-on-one -on -one coaching. And for anybody who's done one-on-one -on -one coaching, um, it's very time consuming. It's very draining. And it's not at all scalable. Like there's only so many people you can talk to a week before you're just totally burnt out. Mm -hmm. um, 
and my one-on-one -on -one group coaching up until recently when mom had a stroke and I wanted to shut down new, new appointments. Um, I was booked out fully for three months. Now you got somebody in chronic pain and they got to wait three months. Yeah. To talk to them. It's not supportive. Yeah. So uh, the group coaching program is this weekly. There are zoom calls for support. We share success stories. Who made some progress this week? What were you able to do? And uh, that's how we start each call. Then I have printed questions because I have a membership website where people can enter a question and say, I'll be on the one o'clock call. Um, this is my question. So I'll hold it up. Okay. Susie has this question. So, all right, Susie, are you here? Unmute yourself. Let's have a chat. And then I'll do one-on-one -on -one coaching with that person, answer their question. In some cases, somebody else in the room may be like, oh, Dan, can I add something here? Because I had a similar situation and this is what I did and it worked for me. And now all of a sudden, it's not just Dan talking at the group. It's mm -hmm. people helping each other. Uh, it's very caring. And if somebody has a success story, you've got you know, a Zoom screen with 25 people on it and people are like, yeah, go you, that's awesome. So they're getting the support. People are cheering for them. In some cases, uh, there are tears shed for the person who's asking the question. You look around the room and it's like, holy crap, there's at least a few other people crying for this person. There's so much empathy in the room. Mm -hmm. And in other cases, there's happy tears because they're so joyous that they're doing so well or they're making progress. And you got other people in the room crying tears of joy for the other people. So it's such a wonderful environment. I couldn't have asked for it to turn out any better as far as creating a community. Um, people in the, in the group actually call each other their pain-free you family. Mm. I, didn't, I didn't make that up. They did. They call each other their family or brother, sister, whatever. Uh, people say that they feel closer with the members of the group than they do with their own family mm. because their family just doesn't get it. Yeah. But by being in this world, they do. So it is a group weekly calls, uh, probably in the next week or two, I will be adding more sessions. I currently do two sessions on Wednesday, 1 PM, 7 PM. I'm going to be adding two more sessions throughout the week okay. and people can show up to whichever one they want, but I want to expand it because group size is getting pretty big. Um, so more group sessions means smaller number of people per session. So very soon there will be, I think, four sessions a week going multiple hours. Like currently the Wednesday calls go upwards of three hours. Oh. Why? Because we share a lot of success and there's a bunch of questions and I make sure everybody gets their questions answered before we end the call. Yeah. That's cool. I don't want to rush through and be like, okay, it's an hour. Got to go. See you next week. Sorry about those six people who had questions. No. So it wasn't intentionally set to three hours, but it naturally runs its course there. Yeah. Um, there's also a video course in the back end of the membership area, 15 okay. video course that maps out all my fundamental stuff. Uh, a couple of PDF documents. Uh, calls are recorded and shared within the membership site. And then there's okay. a private uh, hidden playlist on YouTube that I now have, I don't know, over 170 previous group calls recorded and archived that if anybody wants to go back and look through them. So okay. you get a lot. Cost is a hundred bucks a month. Okay. And some people will say, wow, that's a lot of money. No, if yeah. you show up to one three hour call a week, that's, 12 hours a week yeah no for 100 bucks that's not a lot of money at all yeah and okay. so i literally had somebody email me and say the price is insane mate he's from i don't know where he's from but probably australia the price is insane people with decades of expertise are charging only 30 dollars for similar coaching i'm like not in this space i yeah. know oh, by the way if you think this price is ridiculous you haven't seen anything mm -mm. go talk to you know some psychotherapists that are charging 250 for an hour yeah you know or whatever it may be 
Um, so it is a bargain and I priced it that way intentionally. Um, will I open up one-on-one -on -one calls? Maybe, but right now I want to really focus on the group because you get same information, better support, much more support for less than a single one-on-one -on -one call. Yeah. Yeah. So, it's true. Yeah. Um, but some people are like, no, I need a one-on-one. -on -one. Why? Well, I, I know I need to talk to you. I'm like, you can talk to me every week, literally. You can answer your questions every single week. Yeah, just any question. What else is cool about it is, I have people tell me all the time, I didn't even know I had those questions until I heard somebody else ask, ask them. Yeah. And hearing you answer the question for somebody else made something much more solid in my own mind. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, it's, thank you for asking. I won't drone on about it, drone on about it. Um, but I've been thrilled with how, how well it's working. I do have some people who join. I never see them on the calls and a month later they're gone. Hmm. It's just the nature of the beast. Yeah. And everybody, uh, some people need different approaches and that's totally fine. Right. Yeah. And yeah. other people that show up every single week. And they have been for many, many months. Yeah. You know, on average, people stay about three months. It is, it is interesting because once you, once you understand TMS um, and you really get it, you see it everywhere. You see it in every relationship, every family member, every friend, every child, um, and not just in pain, like you were talking about. I mean, you see it in every symptom. Um, and there is something about being known and being able to um, be in community with people. And, and I kind of love that about my one-on-one -on -one coaching is that um, I'm getting to converse with people <laughs> around this stuff. And the same for your group coaching. You're in a you're in a place where you're you're known and people understand this TMS, and um, you can just relate and connect in that way, which makes us feel safe. Um, yes. so there's, um, there's that piece that I can see as being profound with the group thing. So thanks for, thanks for sharing about that. Yeah, Dan, I just, I appreciate you. Well, I appreciate you bringing me onto your, uh, podcast. Yeah. Um, for it's anybody awesome. who, you know, is interested in a group, great. Go to painfreeu.com to the get help menu. You can find details. Um, but more importantly, for people who either don't want to join a group or don't have the financial means to join, um, I post daily videos on YouTube and Facebook every single day. And I've done it for over 1,370 days in a row without missing a day. Yeah. Um, so the archive is huge. And if you go to dansyoutube.com, it's just a shortened link that automatically forwards you to YouTube. Okay. Yeah, so just my my domain is dansyoutube.com and it'll just bring you to my YouTube page and the video page and you can scroll through tons think, of video. I think it's funny that that just now came up like an hour and 20 minutes into this conversation because yeah, I, I think I am assuming that everybody watching knows that there is just this amazing catalog of videos from Dan that you can just click on any day and help you to calm down, which is fantastic. So, yeah. yeah. I have people saying that, you know, if they wake up in the middle of the night in pain, they'll just put on a video or two of mine and, yep. and can literally feel their symptoms change as a result of listening to clarity and calm. Yeah. Yep. That helps with that mindset, right? We need, we need, sometimes we need help to, to go back to that, that new mindset. So of yeah. safety. So one of my catchphrases is con consistent messages of safety. Yeah. That's exactly what my daily free videos are. It's a consistent message of safety. You're good. You can do this. You'll be fine. And it's working because I got people around the globe. I probably have 38 success stories right now, like video interviews like this, 38 of them. Yeah. And I would probably say 25 have never paid me a dime. They just, watch my daily free videos. Yeah. So look, you don't have to pay me anything, folks. 
Yeah. It really doesn't matter. Yeah. You can still get better. And it doesn't matter what's going on in your life. Like I said, I got better while my marriage was falling apart. So Lots you've of got like crazy stuff going on in your world. You can still get better. You don't have to hurt. You may still have lots of crazy stuff going on in your life. We don't have to fix life to get better. We just you don't have to hurt. I like that. Yeah. You don't. Yeah. Nope. Life can be very lifey, but you don't have to hurt. Yeah. So encouraging. So hopeful. Yeah. Jen, you're awesome. I really appreciate you bringing me on. This was yeah. a fun conversation. It was. I appreciate you too. And I hope you feel better, all the way better soon. Yeah, I'm feeling quite good now. Just a little raspy, but that's okay. But thank you. All right. Well, thanks everybody for watching. I'm going to hit stop, chat with Dan for a minute, and I will be back with you all next week. Bye. All right. Take care, everybody. Thanks.